All right, so why should you contribute a project browser? And <clears throat> for those of you who came in late, there is a bit.ly pb, so it's bit.ly slash pb for project browser, lil, L-I-L-L-E, -L -I -L -L -E, 23. So all the slides are in there with all the links, all the QR codes, everything. So please grab that and you'll have all this information. So why contribute? Well, this is one of the first things people will see when they install Drupal. They want, the next thing they want to do is add some functionality to their core site, right? So you'll all participate in helping with that. And how cool would that be for you to say, wow, I helped build this thing. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things Chris talked about, but the, the key thing is everybody is welcome. If you're a designer, your front end, your back end coder, you know, help Chris out, your accessibility, or you just want to work on the content. So ev believe me, everybody in this room, there's something you can work on. Um, and cu current maintainers are welcome as well to help us out to get these things accomplished in the content area. So there is a bit.ly also, PB contributions. We try to keep that up to date all the time. So even after you leave today, if you go to that link, there are always a whole list of things that people can contribute. So that's something that you should um, you know, mark down as well. All right, so the first thing you want to do is, hey, you're talking about Project Browser. What is it? Where can I see it, right? So I told you, go to the Project Browser page, and there's a QR code here you can grab. Uh, so go to the Project Browser page, click the Try Now button, Try It Now button. Uh, basically, just accept all the defaults that you see, and it spins up a Drupal 10 website with Project Browser installed. All right, so this is what you get um, after it goes through the installation process. And basically what you want to do is just expand. Let me just walk over here a second. Just expand this and it'll actually call up your site. This is showing you all the code and all the composer commands it ran, etc. You don't have to worry about that. Basically just click on the top right and it'll show you your, your uh, site. And there you go. Basically log in with very secure, don't tell anybody this, admin, admin. This is on your, this is on your local site, so it's okay. Um, so just log in there, and then basically, as Chris said, it's hard to find, so we're gonna work on this, but it's the, under extend, it's the last thing down here, browse modules, and then you're in the project browser. So give it a spin. One of the things you can do to help us out is just check it out and create issues in the issue queue. If you find anything that doesn't work quite, quite right, let us know. Please go and check first to make sure that it doesn't already exist because we have quite a few UX, UI type of uh, issues already created there. All right, so this is, let me go one more. All right, so first thing Chris talked about was adding a logo. So most of the logos for the top 100, we've actually gone through. Designers have created them, other people have reviewed them. We're ready now for the maintainers to, to put those into um, Drupal.org. So that is pretty much done. But if you're a maintainer here, and as Chris said, you're not one of the top 100 modules and you want the group to help you create the logo and get it set up, maybe you're the next set down or maybe you feel like I have a brand new module, maybe it's not top 100, but I'd love to have a, a logo for it, let us know. You can actually create a child issue in our meta, create logo issues. Just create a child issue for your module if you'd like, and then we'll have somebody contribute by working on that. All right, so there's guidelines. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through all this because we have a very short amount of time. Uh, but anyway, there's guidelines for you to do. And basically, it's going to pull from GitLab's avatar, uh, which is logo.png in the root folder. So if you're a maintainer, that's where you want to put the, the uh, recommended logo or the suggested logo that the community came up with. And I'm going to show you it's going to show up in all these places. So the logo appears in all the different places once you um, add it to the correct place in your root folder in, in GitLab. All right, we also have a meta for short description. Short descriptions is a 200 character. What does this module do? So basically we want to sum it up 200 characters so it shows on the card view in the project browser, okay? Um, you don't want, you know how the project pages are right now when they go on and on and on. We want just a very concise really meant for site builders and those new to Drupal, what does it do in a very short um, a couple of sentences? We definitely need help with that. We have a lot of them created. People are intimidated with doing the RTBC on the descriptions because they feel like they don't have enough knowledge to make the decision, is this really a non-tactical description of, the of what the module does? So if you have a little bit more experience, you've used some more modules, you could help us out just by reviewing some of these 
And you can get to a whole bunch of them in a very short amount of time. You get contribution credit for helping us out do that, okay? You can also write short descriptions uh, as well for us. So really, what does the module do? 200 characters non-tactical is, is the key. Uh, maintain is you're going to add this to your summary field on the project page. You're going to add the, uh, the short description there, and then it will be brought into the project browser. And then we're going to, well, I'm going to have a buff, I think, in the next, sec the next set of time for, to talk to maintainers, find out the most efficient way for us to give you the suggested logos, the suggested short descriptions. We started creating issues in the, in the maintainers' queues. Not sure that's working as, as well as we thought, so I want to get some input from current maintainers. If there's anybody here, come to the BOF or reach out to us, because that's the next step is to get maintainers to actually make these changes in their queues. All right, now Chris is going to talk to you about the spun recategorization. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> we did come up with, uh, like I said, 19 categories to replace the 20. Did you check? What is it, decoupled? Ah, oh, okay. All right. 20 categories, uh, including decoupled separately now. Um, so what we want to do is we want to go back to Drupal.org and we want to you know, put in some constraints and some help for maintainers on that site. So there's work that can be done uh, here as well for limiting the number of categories to three, I think is, is, is one now. We, we did notice when we were doing our initial analysis, there were uh, some modules who maybe were tagged with 44 of the 55, and the ones that weren't tagged with were the 11 that were created since the module was created. Um, so we want to limit that to three. We want to create a categories help page on drupal.org to help maintainers to say, Here's this category, and here's what kind of modules belong in this category. Here's what we mean by this. We did uh, as much work as we could to involve people who did not speak English as a first language, include a very diverse group of people as we were collecting data around what these categories and descriptions should be. Uh, then we have a migration plan about uh, we should take this old term and tag it. Anything tagged with that should be tagged with this new term. Other terms should be dropped. Uh, so there's a plan outlined there. And then guidelines for creating and adding new categories. You know, we didn't start with 55 categories in the last iteration. They grew and they, you know, inflated as, as time went on. So we want to create guidelines around what should we do and what should our rule set really be about adding a new category? Uh, so they are in the Drupal org issue queue now because it's a change that we want to make on Drupal.org, but it came out of our initiative and the meta is, is right there up top. So, so this is maybe dated because the screenshot does not include uh, decoupled, but where? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, look at you. Mm -hmm. Leslie knew that the screenshot was off, so she added a note. Thank you. Um, so, limiting to three, what was that? Oh, God, I got all, all messed up. But either way, that's the proposed list of categories. Good. And scopes. So, we came up with a description about, like, well, where should my module actually fit? Is it compliance? Maybe that word doesn't necessarily mean to you what it means to me. So, let's get some additional descriptions there. And we took into account comments that were made in the feedback cycle. We did a lot of uh, surveys. We talked to a lot of module maintainers. And again, a diverse group of module maintainers, as diverse as we could obtain, especially people who do not speak English as their first language, to try to make sure that these were understandable to as many people as possible. And then here's our category mappings. This is kind of the plan that we have for, okay, if it's tagged accessibility in the old one, tagged accessibility in the new one. If it's tagged administration, well, all we're going to do is we're, we've actually just renamed that category to administration tools. Um, we've changed commerce and advertising, commerce slash advertising to e-commerce, for example. So we have a whole proposal there. So any of those issues, if you have commentary on them, that's incredibly important. Okay, this one's still me, right? Yes. Okay. The other thing that we want to work on is mapping this project detail page. So when we looked with our real users uh, in the usability study with University of Minnesota, that was a big area that they felt was lacking in the existing prototype. And with good reason, because we only created that to prove that there was plumbing between 
our site and the Drupal.org detail page, but we put, oh, I'd say literally zero thought into how we organize that, like literally zero. Um, so what we want to do is relook at what are the most important parts for newcomers to Drupal? What are the quality indicators? How do I know that this is the module that I want to install? It should tell me what it does, and it should tell me that it's good and trustworthy. And so we're, we want to work out what are, what's the data from Drupal.org's page that's kind of the minimum version of what will communicate that on our detail page inside. Uh, and then we'll provide a link to the Drupal.org full page as needed. Okay. And then there's uh, just a little note about the front end. I talked about this briefly before, but the front end is written in Svelte, which is a sort of newer um, JavaScript framework, sort of along the lines of React and Vue, but a little bit different from each of those and a little bit similar to each of those in its own way. So everything between the header and the footer of the Drupal site when you're looking at the project browser is actually rendered with Svelte. And I use header loosely, like kind of past the breadcrumb and the messages. So whatever that ends up being. But the real app that you're interacting with is really built into uh, Core. So that is a good way for us to potentially get a modern front end framework into Core as we, as we look ahead. We have a little bit of... Um, you know, cursory approvals around this kind of thing, but it is, um, you know, a hurdle that we're willing to take on as we move towards core. If you want to learn a little bit more about Svelte, there are sessions available online between uh, myself and my colleague Jay uh, that we did at Design for Drupal, it's only a few months ago, right? Sure. July. So it's, it's fairly current. Um, Jay gave just an introduction to Svelte and Svelte's concepts completely unrelated to Drupal. And then I talked about how we took those concepts and brought them into Svelte or how we're utilizing them in the Svelte front end for project browsers. So those are two really great ways to learn about what we're up to. And there's, of course, a variety of front end issues that you can work on. Some of them are novice. Some of them require a little bit of knowledge about Drupal's design system and class names. Um, we may be using custom CSS where we don't need to be. We could probably use a Drupal class and you know, get something that comes along for the ride there. Um, we also have some back end issues to work on. So the detail view is obviously a big one that we're, we, I've been pushing. And adding a confirmation page when we install a module. So these really came from uh, usability studies where it's installed and it says that Path Auto is installed, but it doesn't tell you that it also installed a dependency or which version it installed. So we'd like to add a confirmation screen. And getting that plumbing in place will lend itself to some future enhancements that we have. For example, on that confirmation screen, having a module maintainer provide some help text to say, okay, you've now installed Path Auto. Here, is how, here are your next steps. Here's what you can actually configure. Here's the link where you go and do it. And that's what we see as being like a next phase two thing. Oh, I would be remiss if I did not mention the meta to improve Project Browser's test coverage. There's always room to write more tests. And anyone who has any experience with PHP unit in Drupal or PHP unit at all uh, is welcome. We have definitely a lot of opportunity to help write some tests there. So what's really next for us, those alpha blocks, what's really waiting is uh, we kind of depend on package manager, which comes from the automatic updates initiative, which will automatically update your Drupal site. So there are blocker, or I don't know about blockers, but certainly dominoes that are standing in the way of, of package manager getting into core. And one of that is the update framework, so PHP tough. So we need to get the tough work completed, and that's for code security during the update process, making sure that when you're downloading code from the internet that it's good and healthy code, or it's at least signed against um, the package that you expected to download. And so that requires some server infrastructure. So we need to kind of wait on package manager and some of that infrastructure to get completed. Um, with that said, there's plenty of work that can be done on anything that's an MVP issue um, that we can still work on because we have a fully functional, well, yeah, sure, fully functional prototype uh, around um, what can be done. So. 
project browser this week if you're interested in, com in contributing. No, I don't want to talk about that. No, don't talk about that. It's a secret. All right. So I know we're throwing a lot of information at you. Uh, that's why I said make sure you grab the slides. We're just trying to do a high-level overview, but we have limited amount of time to, uh, to do that. So uh, how could you get involved this week? All right, so today there's contrib general contribution going on all the time. Chris is in that room a lot. You can just go there, you know, who Chris is now. Just what, We're very friendly. Just walk up to e either one of us and just say, you know, hi, I'm interested in contributing. Let us know how you would like to. I'm going to go over a few of the ways now. But just approach us any way you see us and say, hey, I'm interested. And we'll definitely uh, talk to you and see how you can best help us out. Because we want everybody in here to become contributors. How many people have never contributed before or interested in doing this for your first time? Okay. Some? Okay, great. Um, we've had a lot of new contributors help with the logos, the descriptions, those type of things. So it's a great way to get involved if you have colleagues that have never contributed, they want an easy on-ramp to contributing, by all means let them know. All right, so this is the session we're doing now. At 4.15, I'm doing a BOF for maintainers, how to prepare your modules, to sh I said to shine in the project browser, but really just how to get your modules ready to appear in the project browser. Uh, Wednesday, Again, all days, general contribution. So if you're between sessions, there's no session I really want to go to. By all means, come up to contrib contribution and help, uh, you know, help us out. Same with Thursday, all day. Thursday, Chris is being involved. Uh, he's in the Drupal Initiative Leads keynote. So he'll give, what, six and a half minutes yeah. on Project Browser. So all the initiatives have a very short amount of time just to introduce the initiative and how you can help with that. So definitely go to that. There's a lot of other initiatives as well that you can help out with. So go listen to all the initiative leads talk about their initiatives. Friday is Contribution Day. Has anybody been to Contribution Day before to DrupalCon? All right, great. Has anybody never been to a Contribution Day? That would be the rest of you. By all means, come. It's so intimidating, honestly. I was intimidated years and years ago when I first came. I'd go and the tools were nowhere near like they are today. It wouldn't spend the whole Contribution Day trying to spin up a local site. And that happened to me twice a year, probably for four years. Not, I'm sorry, two years, two years. So four times probably I went to Contribution Day and did absolutely nothing. And I was frustrated. Nowadays, tools are easy. You have initiatives like this where you don't even have to, you know, you can just spin up the site and give us feedback, stuff like that. So there is first-time contributor workshops. There are three of them this week. It's on another slide. Basically, they just tell you some of the basics ahead of time. So ahead of Friday, you can go. Or you can go on Friday morning to the first-time contributor workshop. Friday afternoon, I'm sorry, Friday all day, there's a mentored contribution where Chris and I will be. And basically, we just help people find issues and help them through the process. So plenty of times to help contribute. So what happens if you can't, well, this is just more on the different times for the uh, first time contributor workshop. So I think that you know each day, there's at least one time here where you can go uh, to that workshop. So these, this is just another slide on when you can contribute. How can you join the initiative? So say you have colleagues, say you know people that aren't here, or you know, you're not staying Friday because you have travel. We have a Slack channel, hashtag project dash browser on Drupal Slack. We have a site builder subcommittee meeting on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is more high level talking about categories, talking about descriptions, talking about the, you know, maybe the project description page. Chris, run, and I run that Tuesday meeting. Chris runs a general meeting on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock Eastern, so we did afternoon morning to hopefully make it accessible more globally. Um, they talk about things a little bit more tactical in the Wednesday, but come to either one of those uh, meetings. Those are held every single week, so by all means, get involved there. Check out the issue queue, and definitely check out that PB contributions link that I gave you if you were late. Jubal, uh, I'm sorry, bit.ly slash pb for project browser, contributions, all one word. That gives you a list of current things that you can work on. Uh, so I said join the project browser Slack channel. There it is there. Chris and I are around. As I said, we're pretty friendly. No, we're very friendly. So just uh, <laughs> say, say hello, hello to us anytime. We'd love to have you all involved. Uh, project browser is only going to be as good as all the community's input. So everything that anybody here has for input would really help out um, the project browser. Uh, just before we get to q and I'm just going to give you these links to give feedback for this session. 
uh, or for any of your sessions. And there's a general conf conference uh, link there as well. So I think we're going to do Q&A now. We have about 10 minutes, which is perfect. Yeah. Uh, so We nailed that. I will walk around. <laughs> yeah, you can, I can walk around. get questions. questions. Yeah. Right there in a minute. Go ahead. So when I'm trying to teach beginners Drupal and I come to this uh, project browser, uh, I often get uh, nowadays uh, intimidated with Composer installation. Mm -hmm. You, yeah, the project browser, as far as I understand, uh, is based on Composer in the background. Mm -hmm. Can I set the position where the browser, uh, the Composer is installed? Because on some cheap uh, providers, mm -hmm. you have to install it yourself. Can that be connected? That is a good question, and I happen to know the answer, even though it's not related to our initiative. So all the Composer stuff, we've handed off to Package Manager, but Package Manager does have the option of uh, where to find Composer configurable inside of config. So you could set it in a settings PHP or config override, and you could tell it, go to you know my home folder and get the composer.far from there, and it will work. Um, you do need access to uh, like a temporary space with enough space because it actually, the process is it takes your whole site, moves it over to a staging area, runs all the composer actions there so that it doesn't mess up your live site, and then make sure that it works before copying it back. So it's, it's very robust in that way. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you guys. This initiative is so, so important. As a small agency that sometimes has to use other platforms, it's really exciting to see this coming to Drupal. Um, I want to ask about essentially discoverability. There's obviously many tens of thousands of Drupal modules, and some of them are really tiny, and some of them are really tiny, but still very useful, and not many people know about them. Um, and I'm sure in this room, there's a couple of maintainers of some of those really small modules. Uh, I'm curious, uh, so I'll try to uh, ask this in a simple, like a straightforward question. I'm curious how, when you search, for instance, what powers that, that search? Is it like just the standard, the same search from the, the Drupal.org, or is there a new search system yeah. for this? Great question. Um, so we are, so let me make the, the difference between using the mock data, which we're doing now, and what really is going to happen in, in hopefully the next few months, knock on wood. Uh, uh, so right now, the, the search, the keyword search, not that great. It really is using like a like query and just like looking through the title and description to try to match a, a keyword. It doesn't work that great, but it works a lot better than it did before, which was only exact match on title as of like a month ago. Uh, but what it will be is a, um, on Drupal.org, we are actually doing a solar query and we're asking the search interface on Drupal.org to return results coming back based on facets and filters and based on keyword relevance scores. So we're able to continually tweak that algorithm as needed through search API on the Drupal side. If we say maybe we boost title by two, maybe that's not enough, maybe later we need to boost it by five, that can all be tweaked and controlled. So the API call that we'll be making for search is, will be powered by search API and solar on the Drupal side. Um, and then the, the sort is also very configurable. So in terms of discoverability, the one that we're showing you by default because of our primary audience of new to Drupal site builders is we're showing you by basically popularity first. So that's why you see token first and then see tools and then path auto. Um, but that's configurable. You can change how you're searching or you could sort by say something like Salesforce, which has kind of a smaller surface area in terms of modules, but the most popular Salesforce integration is going to show up first by default. Uh, and that's all configurable. Yeah, and Good. just one more thing to add. Um, we do have categories as one of the filters. So if they knew that they were looking for a specific category of things, you know, they could just use that category and it won't necessarily bring back the default top 100. It'll mm. bring back things specific to the category that your users are looking for. Yeah, so, uh, search engine optimization or e-commerce or whatever, that's a good starting point. Yeah, I just want... This one's way in the back, so you can hum to yourself while we wait. Um, I just have an addendum to that, which is that the sort order will 
probably have governance around it in the same way that like the marketplace on Drupal.org has governance, the algorithm eventually will take into account things like whether the project has security coverage, whether it has a stable release, whether it follows you know, best practices, no photos, red lanyard, um, in terms of governance and so forth. So um, the, the, it'll be configurable, but the default sort will sort of try to push people towards modules that follow best practices. That's all. Thank you, Jess. Um, I wanted to ask, how does this work for someone who's using version control, or this is just for someone who's using the Drupal user interface to install modules? I want to make sure I understood your question. How does it work for people who are using command line and using some of the more advanced tools? Um, really, at the end of the day, when you install something using the project browser, it goes through that process that I was speaking about before, which it forks off a copy of your site, runs the composer commands there, and then basically R syncs it back from there back to your site. So if you allow that in your production environment, that's something that could happen in your production environment, which means how are you going to get those changes back down into your version control system? It creates some issues. So um, there are really, it really depends on some self-governance about how will we allow this to be used. Um, for example, maybe you don't allow Project Browser to be enabled except in like your local environments, right? So then you can use Project Browser, get your changes, and then run your own git status and git commit to push them up. That's probably what I'll do is uh, still use the project browser to install things because it makes my life easier, but I'm comfortable on the command line. I'm probably going to be then doing git actions there. Now, if this is your grandmother's knitting club site and you just have it on shared hosting, uh, you know, at GoDaddy or something, and it's the permissions are open enough, you might just be running all this in production, but you probably don't have version control anyway. You probably just have backups <laughs> to, to restore. So um, what we wanted to do is, is make it possible to enable grandma's knitting site to work, but um, people who are into advanced development workflows need to be cognizant and, and aware of what this could do to them. Yeah, and one, one thing I forgot while I'm walking up to get this question is we do have a customization where you can enter a source for wh which modules you want to pull in. So if you work for like a university and you have only certain modules that are allowed to be installed by your university, you can create that source and we have a filter where you can actually go and just use your source versus using all the list of modules. Yeah, the, the back ends, the sources that you're pulling data from are completely pluggable through Drupal's plugin system. So you could write your own source to pull from a Google sheet of allowed modules or whatever. It, it was uh, that question I was going to ask. Um, how can we have a custom endpoint to have our, our internal uh, project? Mm -hmm. uh, we have about 20 uh, our own modules we mm -hmm. use for our different clients. Yes. Can we have uh, a separate uh, composer uh, command? Uh, destination for uh, pulling this data. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's really great. Um, um, uh, uh, just in addition, does uh, it run a composer post uh, install command? To, uh, to paste a composer command? Um, in the composer.json file, the com post uh, install command, uh, does it run it? Uh, uh, are these run? Uh, how does it work with the composer? Is it the same as if it was the system call? Yes, okay. yes. So, uh, another good good question. So, and, and that's, that's what I was going to probably address was like, it's the same as running composer on your site. It just first runs it on a copy of your site and then copies it back. So, if you were to say write an additional plugin, which is totally viable and totally something you can do today, we even have a handbook page about how to write your own uh, custom sort of backend source. So, let's say you wanted to add your, your company's 20 modules, you would get another tab, so you'd get drupal.org, then you'd get a tab for like my company's modules and the 20 could be listed there. As long as in your repo, or your project, you can run composer require, you know, Anertech slash uh, 
Dragonfly, whatever, I don't know, I'm making stuff up here. As long as that works with your composer JSON, that will work inside a project browser. So that is a piece that you will need to make sure is working in composer JSON already, but if it is, then you can easily add your custom plugin. You could even replace the Drupal org plugin with your own uh, list of only 100 allowed modules or something like Leslie was saying. Yeah, so we have probably one more question. One more minute. So yep. this is probably the last question, but again, we're very friendly and I'd be more than happy to answer additional questions. Okay, and does this work like two, two ways? Like you install a module via the proje uh, project browser and then you install like a module with Composer. Is it then also in the project browser tagged as installed? Yes, like, actually, as long as it is a module available from your source. So if you were to, um, let's say, install token command line, when you load the project browser, it will show token as either available or installed, just like it does on the, the list page now. So there's a, a state where you can install it, but it knows it's already in your code base, or if it's already turned on, enabled, installed, you'll get a little checkbox that says it's installed. Um, if it's a completely custom module, it won't show in the project browser unless you have a, you know, a custom source plugin that shows your custom modules. Yeah. Okay. So those of you who aren't as technical who are in here saying, what are they talking about with all this composer talk? Remember, the goal of Project Browser is for site builders and those new to Drupal. Yes, it does have this advanced capability, but please don't walk away thinking, oh, this is going to be a really difficult thing to use. It's just in the UI. It's very easy, believe me. Um, this is just allowing people that are more technical to, to know that they can also use the Project Browser. Everybody will be using it. Another real quick one, one more real quick. Anybody have a quick one? Or were you good? All right, we're I think good. we're good. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>